thank you so much again for just taking your time out this evening. Um, I'm going to run you through um, mechanical preparation or cleaning and shaping of the root canal system. And of course, any questions that you guys have at the end of the session, feel free to ask. Obviously, this is not a comprehensive overview of everything to do with cleaning and shaping because that would most probably take me two days. Um, but I'm willing to answer any questions that you have. And this is most probably talking you through some of the philosophies that I have and some of the equipment and materials that I use. And hopefully I'll be able to answer the reasons why for you guys. Last time I talked through about me, so not to bore you to death, I won't repeat what I said, but fundamentally I'm an endodontist who has a passion for teaching. I work at my own surgeries as well as lecturing at the Royal London. Um, and I know a little bit about endo, but I'm always learning. Where do we start? You should always start by what are you trying to achieve? So what are the basic objectives of shaping and cleaning the root canal system? Fundamentally, it comes down to four main things, which is one, removing infected soft and hard tissue. So this is both your infected dentine as well as your necrotic or infected infected pulp tissue. We want to also create space or give disinfecting irrigants access to the apical canal space to make sure we can effectively remove as much bacteria as we can. As we know, the principal aim of endodontics is to treat or prevent apical periodontitis. Fundamentally also when we've created space, um, for the, we also create space after irrigating for the subsequent delivery of medicaments if we're doing it over two stage or we're doing two stage endodontics and subsequently also we want to create the shape that we're subsequently going to obturate and more and more with time it's become fundamentally important to retain the integrity of ridiculous structures and especially around the neck of the tooth last time i talked a lot about preserving as much dentine as you can in the pericervical area of the tooth. Why? We know through finite elemental analysis studies that forces concentrate around the narrowest part of the tooth, which is the neck of the tooth. The more tooth structure you have around the neck of the tooth, the more fracture resistant it is, and the more longer lasting your tooth is going to be or your restoration is going to be. Um, again, the images on the right are just to show you that we think that during our preparation that our file is touching all the walls of the root canal um, system. Actually, many areas of the root canal system remain or root canal walls remain completely untouched. And that's why I always call it um, shaping and cleaning and we don't teach this independently of one another. How do you prepare your root canals and what with? Okay, your methodology should fundamentally be broken down into three main components. These are the files we use, the motor units we have, and now we have some quite in quite modern and quite complex motor units that can help the process, and also the strategies that we employ. So I'll break this seminar down into, down into these three main parts, and then we'll take it from there. Okay, files. This always confuses me, and it's the first question that everyone asks. It's like, which file system do you use and why? What are we using? Tell me what you're using. I want to use yours. There's too many. Okay, there are so many file systems now on the market that it could confuse anyone with more and more interesting names like Tango Endo, even more exciting is Vortex, um, Typhoon. And as you can see, manufacturers are there designed design files to help encourage you to use this, but which one's better and what properties are you looking for? Too many. Before I answer that question, let's just run through some facts about files. Again, I'll only give you my opinion. So the file system that I use, I'll talk you through it. I use more than one as an endodontist. There's many ways of doing root canals, uh, root canal treatment, and there's no one perfect file system. But you want to learn and know about what you're using and what its properties are and in which scenario it works best. Fact number one, conventional files have an O2 taper or a 2% taper. What does that mean? For every millimeter you go up your um, hand file, it is 0.02 millimeters larger. 
So size 10 file at its tip is 0.1 millimeters, a millimeter away from that, 0.12, two millimeters away, 0.14, three millimeters away, 0.16. I'm guessing by now you catch my drift. Um, and why is that important? Because if you know the shape that you're preparing, then subsequently, if you feel resistance during the procedure, you can start to figure out how tight or how narrow a root canal space is. Or is there an acute curvature at that point? Or has it been previously alleged? These are all questions that you can ask yourself. But if you don't understand how a file is designed and how it's machined, you wouldn't know what the width or it width of the file is at, at that point you wouldn't even have an idea of what the tip of the file is at that point so it's very very important to bear that in mind um most hand files will also come in 21 millimeter 25 millimeter 28 millimeter and even 31 millimeter files so obviously in more challenging access cases choose a smaller file so a 21 on a lower 21 millimeter file on a lower seven can sometimes be very very helpful because we know how awkward it gets when root canal treating teeth with difficult access. Others, facts to know about your hand files, it has a 16 millimeter cutting tip. So from the uh, 16 millimeter cutting length, so from the tip of the file to where um, the cutting edges end is 16 millimeters. And that's why sometimes you see endodontists like they're not even measuring the file. We know roughly where we are and then we measure it for our working length. Almost all newer file systems have different constant tapers, okay, uh, such as high flex, high flex EDM. So all, almost all newer files have different constant tapers. So they're not produced as ISO standards. They'll have 04 tapers, 06 tapers, and some file systems still have a variable taper, such as Pro Taper Gold, as well as high flex EDM, okay, the one file has a variable taper along its length, which may offer you advantages and disadvantages, so long as you understand that. Older files are made from stainless steel and traditional NITAR wire. So your hand files are obviously made from stainless steel. Its main benefits are it's going to give you tactile feedback, okay? Um, but it's key, the limitations are it's not as flexible as NITAR. And your traditional NITAR where it has super elasticity and shape memory. Um, but this was your old ProTaper Universal, not now the heat treated night eye or night eye that's made of more flexible wire such as CM wire. Um, the benefits of these files are they're basically an upgrade to the traditional night eye because they have extreme um, flexibility and uh, as well as having extreme flexibility, they've got greater fracture resistance. Um, and we'll go through why in a minute. Your older files are either twisted or machined. Most hand files, like okay, Flexo files, are twisted into shape, okay? And newer files are machined and uh, machined to cut innovative shapes to enhance their cutting properties. They can cut either clockwise or anti-clockwise, most of your traditional rotary um, night eye or rotary night eye that you'd use, such as high flex EDM, protape, protape, the next cut in a clockwise direction. Recently, there's been an influx of um, reciprocating files to the market. Okay, we all know them, such as wave one, reciproc, files of greater taper. These cut in an anti clockwise motion. So it's important that you know which direction your file is cutting in. Um, I prefer continuous clockwise motion. Historically, I have used reciproc in the past. I am now an avid high flex EDM and CM user, as well as on occasions other file systems. The two main varieties of files, like we talked about, are hand files and then engine driven files. Question is, what do you use and when? For me, before you introduce engine driven files, you always have to use hand files. Why? Hand files provide you with greater tactile feedback and allow you to judge the anatomy of the root canal system um, and also allow you, allow you to feel, feel yourself into the root canal. You can tell or start to feel if there's any resistance, which may be due to mineralization or sclerosis within the canals or resistance caused by acute curvatures, which you would 
all have evaluated using your pre-operative x-rays, um, which we talked about last time. Engine-driven files um, can only be used, in my opinion, once an effective glide path is being created by hand files. For me, what is an effective glide path? Okay, um, a size 10 hand file that passively goes to working length, i.e. I'm not working that size 10 hand file to length. It can passively go to full working length and be removed with minimal resistance before I introduce engine driven files. Um, do I go to a larger than size 10 glide path um, using hand files? No, I don't. Why? Because the rotary systems that I use have effective glide path files, such as the HyFlex EDM 1005 or the HyFlex EDM 1503. The 10 or 15 tells you the size of the file at its tip. The 05 and 03 tell you the taper of the file. Hand files, its advantages, okay, fundamentally are it gives you more control over your preparation, okay, and you will get tactile feedback. The disadvantages, okay, the conventional ISO files can engage along the entire length of its flutes. Um, as size increases, more of the flutes tend to bind in the middle or coronal area of the canal. Um, and it may be that you have to carry out more effective coronal flaring prior to introducing files deeper within the root canal system. Um, and it can also be difficult to increase from one file size to the next. A typical example of this is most people commonly say to me, oh, I can get a size 10 to working length. But when I try and get a size 15 to working length, I feel a lot of resistance. The reason why, guys, is that's the greatest jump in diameter. A size 10 to a size 15. A size 15 is one and a half times bigger at its tip than a size 10. A size 10 at its tip is 0.1 millimeters, whereas a size 15 is 0.15. So if you are doing hand preparations, the jump from the size 10 to the size 15 file is where you should be most cautious and try and avoid ledging the file. Remember, it should be the root canal system that guides you, not the force that you apply from your hand. The more force you apply from your hand, the more likely you are to get canal transportation. Also, because we're all, always in a hurry, hand files are very time consuming. Engine driven files or using rotary or reciprocating files. Its main benefits are speed and cutting efficiency, but its main disadvantages, okay, are that there is a loss of control um, and there's an increased speed of error. If you don't know what you're doing and you haven't planned the process, you're more likely to get um, errors in process, such as separated instruments, deviations blockage of the canal due to ineffective irrigation. So quick doesn't necessarily mean better, but if there's a more effective way of doing it, I'm sure I'll definitely choose that way. What do I use just to give you a brief overview? Okay, I'm not gonna bore you, um, but I use HyFlex EDM files. This is the one file, but I never generally speaking ever use just the one file, I use a combination of glide, but they have glide pass files, preparation files, the one file, and then also finishing files. And what I love about the system is you've got multiple files, so you can plan your root canal treatment to what the root canal system asks of you, rather than tailoring your preparation to what the manufacturers tell you, which I don't think is as effective. Also, it has different cross sections along its file where it needs to cut more efficiently. Um, it has a more uh, rectangular shape, whereas where it, it then transforms to more of a trapezoidal shape to then a triangular cross section. Benefits of HyFlex EDM. One, it is made of CM wire, okay, because it's C made of CM wire, which is control memory wire, okay. Basically, CM wires are more martensitic at room temperature. And in its, a night eye wire in its martensitic form is more flexible. And because it's more flexible, 
you'll get superior canal tracking. So you'll follow the anatomy of the root canal system more. It also has regenerative properties, which in this country has no net benefit because we do not reuse our files. But abroad, if you'd autoclave the file, um, it will go back to its original shape. I'm not an advocate of that and I never will be. Uh, we are single use in the UK, so I would always, always, always recommend just using the files in single use. But obviously, it does have regenerative pro properties. It's also been shown to have excellent fracture resistance, okay, or fatigue resistance. File, uh, files fail through two ways, okay, um, which is torsional failure, and then this cyclical failure or cyclical fatigue. Cyclical, uh, cyclical fatigue is when you overuse the file and it is constantly being um, talked. And then two um, is uh, torsional failure when the tip of the file becomes locked within the root canal system because you're applying too much force and it's blocked and the file continues to the spin. That is when you'll get file separation. The motor I use, okay, um, is the Jenny motor, but fundamentally you need a motor that will allow you to have speed and torque control. So you can use whichever motor you want, guys, okay? So long as it gives you speed and torque control, you're okay. And you follow the manufacturer's guidelines as to what speed and torque setting you should use that file system for. This is just automates your process a little bit more. And its main benefits are it has a Jenny mode. So we're currently in endo. There's always a debate about whether you should use rotary motion or reciprocating motion. What are the benefit, what are the advantages and disadvantages of both? Well, with this motor, it has through its microprocessors, it's able to take the stress on the stress on the file. So what that means is when it starts off, it starts off in a rotary motion. When it feels that the stress is building up on the file, it then goes into a reciprocating motion and it doesn't allow you to remain in the root canal system too long or apply too much stress. If it finds that you're there too long, it will start to do a long beep, which tells you, did you've been spinning too long, get out, clean and disinfect the root canal system um, by irrigating, okay? General rule, every time you introduce a file into the root canal system, it should be followed by irrigation and recapitulation. I irrigate with 5.25% sodium hypochlorite. Um, a common question is, well, why do you use such a high concentration when lower concentrations have been just shown, be, been shown to be just as effective as killing bacteria? Um, the answer is yes, they are just as effective as killing bacteria, but they're tissue dissolving um, capacity. I, if there's necrotic tissue and pulp tissue within the space or root canal space, high concentrations will dissolve that quicker. And I want to make sure I effectively remove the infected soft and hard tissue as best I can. Um, other benefits, like I said, it's got a rinse notification. It also, if the file starts to distort, it will get present you with several short beeps, which reminds you or tells you you need to change file or this file is now damaged. But fundamentally, guys, my advice to you is always inspect your files before introducing them into the root canal system and every time you take them out. Because if you don't know what normal is, you don't know if damage is being caused to the file during preparation. So always, always, always check before and then during the process as well. So every time you've used the file, take it out, make sure it's not distorting or changing its shape. Another key benefit or why I love this motor is it's got an integrated apex locator. So whilst I'm using my rotary files, I'm able to use the apex locator at the same time. What does that do? It just reduces my stress during treatment because at all times, I know where I am in relation to my working length. I always check my working length with hand files first, but I'm also then able to check my working length throughout the process with the inbuilt apex locator. And it's a fantastic bit of kit.
Preparation strategies, to give you a quick overview. Okay, I'm sure all of you have heard some of these words, apical coronal, coronal apical preparation, step back, step down, cram down pressureless. Traditional or the traditional step back from the 19 or late 1970s was where you enlarge your apical region first to a master apical file 25 or 30, and then you place any, then any success, uh, successfully larger instrument would be placed one millimeter shorter than working length, and that would produce your taper, okay? If you're placing it one millimeter short, okay, and you get your master apical file is a size 25, and then you go one millimeter short is a 30, two millimeter short is a 35, three millimeters short is a 40, you're creating an 05 taper, okay? Because at its tip, it's 0.25, one millimeter away is 0.3, two millimeters away, 0.35. So by knowing what files you're using and what their tip sizes are and how they're tapered, you can also start to see what shape you're preparing and you can start to work out even during your obturation if something's not fitting as effectively, why isn't it fitting? What is the shape I've created? Is the shape that I've created the same as what my obturation is asking for me, which we'll talk about next time, okay? You'd also recapitulate between each step back file with the master apical file. For me, I'd say this is biologically unsafe. The why, I'd normally ask you this in a presentation, why is it biologically unsafe? Put simply, you're pushing, or the majority of the bacteria is found in the coronal pulp chamber and coronally within the root canals. Before effectively irrigating all of that away, you're taking files further and further down the root canal system. Let's get rid of the bacteria coronally first before we introduce files more deeper into the root canal system. Crown down pressureless, okay, um, or step down or a corona apical approach, its main benefits, um, which all of us use, okay, or which is recommended, is it permits fundamentally straight line access to the apical thread. That point may no, long, no longer be valid because we are now using more flexible files. And by using more flexible files, we're able to not do those significant flares coronally and weaken the tooth pericervically. We can keep our coronal preparations a little bit more narrower, but we'd enhance our irrigation throughout the process. Um, early debridement of the coronal part of the canal before reaching apex benefit, majority of bacteria found there. It allows deeper penetration of irrigants, obviously because you're creating more space um, for your irrigating needle to go further down within the root canal system. Early coronal winding eliminates coronal and middle thread interferences whilst creating the glide path, okay? True, but now with more flexible glide path files, okay? You have to ask yourself the question, where are we along the spectrum? Are you wider preps or more narrow preps with enhanced irrigation? I am now more most probably towards narrower preparations and more enhanced irrigation. But as an endodontist, I spend a significant time doing my root canal treatments. I never rush the process, which means there's more irrigant in the tooth for longer, which means I feel more comfortable with my disinfecting regime. And I also audit my results to see how we're doing. Also, when you widen the canal coronally or you do a coronal apical preparation, there's less alteration of working length. Constantly check your working length throughout the procedure, guys. Never just assume it remains the same because if the root canal is severely curved and the more you open it up, the working length can sometimes change. And with early coronal widening, you get better control over apical instrumentation. So to help those of you that want to visualize it, this is what a crown down brushless sequence looks like. You're widening the canal coronally before going deeper within the root canal system. For me, step back technique without early coronal flaring, and that's a double modified technique, 
Traditional step back by itself, I'm not too sure about. Step down or crying down pressureless is what everyone is doing. This is just to introduce you to a new method of thinking because we have more flexible files such as CM wire and CM files. You can use, the, use them with a technique called touch control activation. I'm sure at university, and all of you can ask me this question, um, I'm sure you were always taught never start a rotary file within the root canal system, always start it outside and never let it stop within. Well, those are with more your traditional NITI files, not your heat treated or CM wire, CM wire NITI files such as Hyflex EDM or CM or um, what's another common one on the market? Um, VX Flexi files are all CM, CM wire files, okay? Because these files are more flexible, you can place the instrument in the canal until resistance occurs. You turn on your handpiece and with the file guiding you within the root canal system and not the pressure from your hand, okay? So there is limited force coming from your hand, you're letting the root canal system guide the file with less pressure from your hand and not lots of pressure from your hand guiding the file into the root canal system because there's more chances of transportation. You turn on the iron piece and you work in one or two millimeter apical um, preparations. And then you move the file back and clean out, irrigate abundantly, recapitulate with your size 10 glide pass, as size, size 10 hand file, which you would have used before any of these files have been introduced. And then you slowly reach the working length, working in one or two millimeter segments. This is how we as endodontists can sometimes prepare severely curved canals more effectively. And I'd always say the more curved a root canal, the less likely a one file system will work and will prove to be effective because you're trying to open up the canal space too quickly. And either you're gonna to get too much debris built up ahead of the file, or you're just gonna to feel too much resistance because you're trying to put something really large into something really narrow, which never works as effectively. If you ever wanted to take a screenshot, okay, of anything, it's most probably this. Um, a cutting edge protocol. For me, where do we fill to or narrowest point of taper? Or you want your apex located at zero reading, take away 0.5 millimeters, because we want to keep the obturation material within the root canal system and avoid extrusion. Now with biceramic sealers, if you get a little bit of sealer extrusion, they are bone loving. Okay, they're less likely to cause a cytotoxic reaction. So it's not as much of an issue as it was historically. But if you're using the more traditional materials, there can be some issues there. Okay, what's the size? So commonly it's like, what size do you finish to? Well, you'd only know that by doing apical gauging because the gauging would determine what file size you finish to. Commonly, just look out for your upper palatal canals being a lot wider. Um, and your lower distal canals being quite wide. And we talked about last time that you should all be checking for a second distal. Files use super flexible NITI M wire or CM wire. For me, this is the future. Okay, not all may follow what I say, um, but I just think it makes your processes more predictable. So long as you learn how to use them using touch controlled activation, you won't have any problems. Drive units. Like I said, I don't mind which motor you use so long as you can control the torque and the speed and you follow the manufacturer's guidelines, okay? As to what those settings should be and not your own guidelines, okay? And the motions obviously are hand rotary reciprocating and then obviously the Jenny motor has the Jenny mode. And then preparation strategies always follow a corona apical technique um, is proven to be more effective. What I would do, okay, or what are my thought processes? One, always assess the case difficulty first. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail, okay? I think that's the second time I've said it. Um, so always, always, always plan the process. Provide adequate access. 
determine your working length and create an effective glide pass. For me, that's a passive size 10 hand file to working length, followed by the use of glide pass files where necessary. And then I can finish off my preparation however I like, depending on what the uh, width is after apical gauging. Use light touch, light touch and do not push. I think the do not push is big. I want you all to be mindful of next time you do a root canal, when you're one millimeter away from the working length that you've just determined and you're feeling resistance, the natural tendency is it's only a millimeter and you push on the motor. That is no longer the root canal system guiding the file, it is the pressure from your hand. And if this anatomy does not like it, you'll get a file fracture. So please, please, please do not push, light touch, let the anatomy guide the file and not your hand, okay? Proceed with the crown down pressure sequence. For me, I use touch controlled activation, which hopefully one day I get the privilege of teaching you guys. And this one, everyone misses out. Um, inspect your instruments frequently and replace when necessary. If you don't even see that a file is distorting, how are you ever gonna know if it's gonna break or not? Ask yourself the question, how many times have you guys looked at a file before introducing it into a root canal system to make sure it's not distorted? I do it every single time, okay? It will save you a separated instrument, okay? We all love to blame the files. Oh, it's a crap file using the wrong system. Most of the time it's us applying too much pressure or not evaluating our files throughout the process. Like we said, and like we talked about last time, proper access and canal location is only complete when the entire pulp chamber floor is visible without any overlying obstructions. We talked about how some of these preparations are larger, but please bear that in mind, okay? Uh, make your life simple if you can, okay? And that follows on to the golden rule. I'll always give you a golden rule, okay? The walls of the root canal rather than the walls of the access preparation should guide the passage of instruments into the canal. So make sure you've opened up the canal effectively enough. I'm an advocate of preserving pericervical dentin, so I don't use gates glidens, but if you did, don't try and take them deep within the root canal system. They're only acting as openness, okay? And the one that you choose is the largest that can be placed passively two millimeters apical to the orifice and just open it up slowly. Straight root canals, like I said, a passive size 10 hand file with a glide path file. And then if it's straight and relatively open, you can finish with a one file and gauge whether that's good enough. More curved files, you may start to use a preparation file or medium curved canals. You may start to use a preparation file, which is a 2005 before using a 25 or variable taper file. And then in extremely curved root canals, you may use two glide path files before using a preparation file and decide, hang on a second, this is so curved. How am I gonna get this larger variable taper file all the way around the bend? And if it's so curved and it's so long and it's constricted, do I wanna risk separating a larger file? Do I want to enhance my irrigation? Most probably. So as you can see, this is the reason why I don't like a one size fits all approach. I could teach you all, let's use wave one quickly. Yes, you can use wave one, but just use it in steps then. Don't try and reach working length as quickly as possible. Break down the process, remove the resistance that I assigned more coronally, and then in the middle region before preparing your apical region. I would love to give all of you a demo now, okay? But unfortunately, we won't have a setup for that. And I will teach you this in a clinical setting if I had the time. Uh, running through a few cases, like I said, if you plan the process, generally speaking, you'll be okay, okay? Look for length, length of expected root canals, look for curvatures, okay? as well as looking for length and curvature, look for any calcifications or sclerosis, 
All of these are making your root canal treatments more challenging. Is there an MB1? Is there an MB2? These cases are not to show off how good I am. They're just showing what can be feasible. Um, trying to save the unsavable on the left. Okay, but having said that, that tooth is there three, four years later. Okay, um, and the patient has got a functioning posterior unit. Uh, one on the right to show. If you don't necessarily gauge your apex, you'll sometimes get more sealer extrusion. I did gauge in this case, but I got quite a lot of sealer extrusion there. Okay, but that's a bioceramic sealer. And that is honestly effectively healing many years on. These are just a couple of more straightforward cases. I would love to talk to you guys about the concept of deep marginal elevation because I think if many people call things deep marginal elevation, deep marginal elevation, I've done DME, but they don't actually know what DME is. Um, and they're not using the appropriate materials or the appropriate skill set and band set to do DME. Other cases, again, interesting. On the left hand side, you can see how sometimes we assume that the palatal was only one. Just to highlight the complexities of the root canal system, you can see that palatal had a clear delta or lateral canal in its apical thirds. Never rule out or never give up on teeth too early. Okay. If you can't understand whether a tooth has had a root fracture or not. You should learn what factors influence whether there is a root fracture or not. But the x-rays on the left had a presentation which was typical, or you would have suspected radiographically that there may have been a root fracture there. Um, however, there was no deep pocketing, and as such, or no deep isolated pockets, and as such, we carried out the root canal treatment with subsequent composite. I don't like calling it core. I call it creating the bio base and then subsequently putting an Emax crown on top. I promise you, you get good at single tooth dentistry. Single tooth dentistry is the most effective dentistry. And as well as that, it's very enjoyable. Other cases, these are all relatively simple and straightforward. As you can see, I'm a big fan of Emax onlays and I'm an advocate of them. Again, one on the right, that's removing an old post in core with a new post core crown on top. Um, I didn't do the crown because obviously I'm the endodontist. If some of you are going on to do FD training in London next year, I will have the privilege, hopefully, of teaching you post and cores with maybe some endo seminars. Here, looking at teeth, left hand side case, creating the right emergence profile for your teeth. Can you see how we use the DME band to make sure that our bio base is effectively shaped and is flaring out and is not got the wrong emergence profile, which commonly occurs. Endo through crowns or Emacs onlays, I only tend to do through those that have been recently placed. This is one where my associate did the Emacs onlay or crown on the right hand side, tooth went non vital. We had to go and in and do the endo. I was happy with the seal they'd created. There were no issues. So we continue on. And again, this is just more of the same. Okay. There's nothing fancy there. Obviously, I look forward to seeing many of you guys next year or in the future. Um, and obviously, if you have any other questions, I am going to be here to answer them. Um, or if you are shy and don't like a group situation, you can message me on Instagram. Thank you very much. And I'm here to answer any questions.